Why don't you grab a Bible? You'll find a Bible underneath your seat if you're down here on the floor. No, you'll find it in the seat in front of you if you're down here on the floor. You'll find it underneath your seat if you're up in the stadium seat. I hadn't done that before. That's a new one. Okay. All right. And turn with me to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. It's going to be on page 1016. Page 1016. We'll be texting this evening as well. We're going to be talking about elders and who leads the church and how is the church led and who are these folks who lead the church. So if you have questions about that, and the way you can ask questions here at Park is you text them in. And in the, your text app, the phone number is 62953, 62953. Then in the body of the text, you need to put Ask Park. Make sure those two words are included, Ask Park, and then your question. And then at the end of the very end of the service, we'll take some time and answer those questions. We've gotten some very good ones today. Also, I'm not going to be teaching alone. We're going to team teach. I have two of our elders sitting up here, and they're the elders here for the Near North Campus. They're your elders, and so we're going to be sharing this and walking through this text together. Rafe Chinnery, who is our Near South Campus pastor, went to Indiana University and was on the cycling team. And they would go to San Diego to practice, and they, they would practice on this island called The Island. And it was 2.5 miles around. And Rafe was saying, when you hit the back stretch of this island, though, the headwind was incredibly strong. There was times you would pedal away and feel like you were going nowhere. And he said it was a great race, a great place to train because of the difficulty of that particular headwind on that particular side of the island. They had been there practicing for a while, and now they divided their team of eight. As you see a picture here behind of this team, they divided their team of eight into two teams of four, and they were competing against each other to secure a spot in the next event. So they take off, and they've gone a couple times around the island by now, and the Rafe's team is about 70 yards out front. Then they come around the corner, and they hit the back side of the island, and that head went. And Rafe said, my thighs were burning. I was out of breath. I was exhausted. And he was the last one of the four, and he began to lose his technique, and little by little he began to drift, first 10 yards, then 20 yards. And he knew all too well that if the other team could get all four of their riders past him, they would win. And then something happened. The head rider for his team, who also happened to be the captain of the team, saw that Rafe was dropping behind, and he dropped back and came alongside Rafe. And as they're riding together, he looks at Rafe and says, remember your technique. Get your elbows in. Get your body rigid. Get your back straight and let that wind flow over you. And then he says, get on my wheel, meaning I'll draft you. And so he pulls in front of Rafe, and Rafe pulls behind him. And I don't know if you know anything about cycling and drafting, but the person behind the lead guy will find a 40% decrease in resistance from that front guy. And now they're able to make up the time. They're able to get back in the pack and go on and finish and win the race. When we think about elders at a church, we think about that lead rider. In the midst of struggles and difficulties and persecution like we've been talking about with 1 Peter, elders, the elders' job is to come back and to make sure that they're walking with those that are struggling, to say to them, don't forget the basics. Remember, there is hope. Don't forget there's joy. This is not your story. God's not done with you. You are known completely and loved entirely. And then it's the elders' job to say, follow me. Follow me. Watch me. See how I live life and mimic me. Imitate me. And that's what we're going to look at for a few minutes tonight. So turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to be in verse 1. So I exhort you, the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. All right, let me pause here. Let me talk for a second about the difference between deacons and elders, and we have both here at Park. Deacons have delegated authority from the elders, and their job, according to Acts 6, is to come alongside those who are struggling and those that are going through a difficult season. They also oversee our benevolence here at Park. They're the ones that are available after every service to pray with you or to talk with you about whatever issues are going on in your life. And we have great deacons, and we have deacons spread out over every campus. 
An elder, on the other hand, an elder is defined for us in 1 Timothy 3 as well as in Titus 1, and we see it all through the book of Acts that they were raised up in every church that Paul starts. In every city, elders are raised up to be able to lead, to care, to protect, to be mindful of what the teaching should be for the church. That's their role. And so elders and deacons work hand in hand. When you read through the New Testament, you'll see a couple of different names for elders. You'll see elders, you'll see shepherds, and you'll see overseers. Overseers, sometimes how we translate into English the word bishop. An elder could be a bishop. Frankly, I like that title. I would prefer if you from now on call me Bishop Jackson, if that's okay with you. Bishop, no? no? Okay. But you see those terms as we read through the New Testament. And so all those terms mean the same thing. Now look what it says here. He says, Peter says, and elders among you. Now he's speaking to the elders and he does it in this letter. Why does he do it in this letter? Why does he include, why does he write a different letter to the elders? For a couple of reasons. One, he wants the people to know what's expected from an elder for accountability's sake. He writes to the elders, and everybody hears this letter. Is this letter from Peter is going to be read in churches all over the region? That is in the center part of the northern part of Turkey. And so he wants to make sure that the elders are held accountable to the things he says to them, but also so that everyone else knows what's their responsibility to the elders. And we'll get there, what their responsibility is to the elders. He calls himself a fellow elder understanding the difficulties and the joys of leading. But at the same time, he says, I'm the same as you, but I'm different from you. And if you look down, it talks about the sufferings of Christ, that he had seen the sufferings of Christ. That's a way for him to identify himself as an apostle. You go back to the very first verse of 1 Peter, and he says, I'm an apostle. He speaks with one who has authority. Now, I've just laid out the first verse and talked at a high level about what a an elder is supposed to be. Now I'm going to invite my two elders to come up and to dig into verses 2 and 3 and to talk more specifically about how an elder is supposed to function. Good evening. Uh, My name is Emil Heitkamp, and I'm very blessed to be one of the Near North Campus elders, along with my partner here, Jay Knobloch. And uh, uh, a little bit about me. I'm uh, born and raised in Chicago, and... uh, my wife and I have been down here in the city at Tending Park for 11 years, and I'm kind of can't help but say, but this month we had our 43rd wedding anniversary, so we like that. Thank you. And uh, we have two great children, my son, Emil. I didn't have a lot of imagination there, you know. Uh, and his uh, beautiful wife, Kim, and their new ba- seven-month-old baby, Roland. There you go. And then my daughter, Rebecca. Uh, who lives out in uh, Baltimore and is coming in for Labor Day, so I'm getting pumped for that. And Rebecca, she works at Johns Hopkins, some of you may have heard of that, and she spends half her time in Africa, so that keeps her mother and me on our knees, so uh, as you all know. But tonight, I'd like to go together and look at verse 2 of this passage. Let me read it for us. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. I would like to focus on the word shepherd, then comment briefly on the rest of the verse. The best-known shepherd uh, of the Old Testament was David. David was out tending his father's sheep when the prophet Samuel arrived uh, to choose a new king from the eight sons of Jesse. But David was not just a shepherd. David was also a warrior. I think we all have heard of his fight against, well, he was a young warrior, then Goliath. But he also then was the king, the king of Israel. Interestingly enough, Jesus, in addition to being the great shepherd, is also a warrior and a king and, uh, who sits on the throne of David forever to rule and reign. However, when Peter defines the role of an elder, he does not call them warriors and he does not call them kings, but instead he refers to them all as shepherds. In doing so, I believe he looked in part to two key moments in Jesus' life. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, 14 and 15, uh, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. 
I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. We see this shepherd theme repeated again in John 21, 15 to 17, when the resurrected Jesus had just finished cooking breakfast for Peter and the other disciples. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He, Peter, said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, son, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had to say to him the third, he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So when Peter uses the verb shepherd in verse 2, here in chapter 5, he definitely recalled Jesus telling the parable of the good shepherd and, in addition, how he felt that morning when Jesus told him three times to feed my sheep. Peter was told to shepherd the Lord's sheep, and now he, through this letter, is challenging his fellow elders to do the same. We can also look to the words of Psalm 23, which we read together tonight when clarifying the elders' role as shepherds of uh, their congregations. This beloved psalm helps to find the duties of an elder. They are to lead by example, not just by words, but by deeds, to provide spiritual guidance based on solid biblical truth and feeding, first and foremost, from the Word of God. I did some additional reading on sheep and shepherds in preparing this sermon Sheep need a lot of tender love and care. They can easily get lost, so shepherds oftentimes need to go find them. They're pretty defenseless against predators, which is why they need a shepherd to protect them. Frankly, the more I read about sheep, the more I understood why God used the shepherd-sheep metaphor throughout the Bible. I definitely saw a lot of myself in the sheep. So elders need to be caring, loving, committed to finding the lost sheep, and to protecting the sheep from all the various predators in our culture who are constantly trying to pull seekers and believers away from the truth of the Bible and from the safety of a biblically focused church and the fellowship with other believers. Now, the wolves go after the weak sheep on the edges of the flock. So in order to survive, sheep need to be strong. And for this reason, they need to be well-fed. And what is the best food for a follower of Christ? We see it in Deuteronomy 8.3 when Moses, speaking to the Israelites, said, Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We see God's flock being fed and watered in the words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So one of the key responsibilities for elders is to make sure their church's teaching is based on biblically accurate theology, which produces solid doctrine, solid, reliable doctrine. And the best way for anyone, including elders, to be able to identify counterfeit teaching is to have a deep, abiding knowledge of God's word and truth as expressed in the 66 books of the Bible. However, you need to understand that it's not only elders... It's not just us, the elders, who are responsible for identifying false teaching. The Bible is very clear that all of us, every one of us, is both elder and congregant, need to have sufficient Bible knowledge to be able to hold your teachers and leaders accountable. Don't let yourselves be sheep who follow any leader blindly. I'd like to share a personal note. For many years, I've been faithful to read the Bible on a daily basis, This has served me well over the years. But after I became an elder, I began to realize that just reading the Bible was just not enough. Now, it's not like I was biblically ignorant. Over the years, in addition to regularly reading the Bible, I have sat under excellent teachers. I've read multiple books and commentaries about the Bible. I've participated in various conferences and study groups, so I knew quite a bit about biblical topics. 
But the pivotal moment that helped me to realize that I, my need for a deeper, richer knowledge of Scripture came when I was struggling to find a God-honoring solution to a particularly difficult issue I was dealing with as one of the elders. I realized that what I was lacking were more sophisticated Bible study tools so I could go directly to God's Word on my own and learn firsthand what God wanted me to know about all aspects of knowing God and making Him known. Now, I've been working on this area the past few months, and I want to stay committed to growing my biblical knowledge through building up my Bible study skills. That is what I have had, that is when I had my aha moment. I realized in studying those words deeply that God himself had already put everything I needed to know in order to solve this problem in the pages of the Bible. God didn't need any help from Emil Heitkamp, all right? He knew before time began that that particular, that specific issue I was dealing with was going to happen. It was not a surprise to him. So once I had this epiphany, I began to look for specific practices that dealt with the difficult problem I was wrestling with, and lo and behold, the answers were right there in front of my eyes. When I brought those biblical insights into the problem-solving process, things moved along relatively quickly to a, very, well, to a positive conclusion. So my suggestion to you, to all of you, to myself, for when you are facing a problem of any type, you look for truth and wisdom in the words of the Bible. Commit to strengthening your Bible skills on an ongoing basis. You will not be disappointed. Now let us continue reading in verse 2. Not under compulsion, but willing, as God would have you. Just as God loves a cheerful giver, he loves teachers who are positive and love their work. Elders have the privilege of serving members of the church in the best of times as well as some of the worst of times. Elders walk with people through the valley of the shadow of death, but we are also, but we are also with them to celebrate their mountaintop moments. It's both exhilarating and fulfilling. However, and we're talking about not under compulsion, however, if an elder feels that the duties required of him are too burdensome, then they need to prayerfully think about it and perhaps even possibly step aside for a season. Or they may discover that their gifts and talents could be applied more joyfully somewhere else in the church. And finally, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. I have unfortunately seen, and I'm sure you have too, where becoming an elder is a popularity contest, which results in people who are not biblically qualified being given the title of elder. Yeah, elders are not to serve for the applause of people. We also read about scandals at churches where elders and other leaders were using their positions for financial gain. Peter is definitely warning us about this type of behavior. But in contrast, then, Peter says they should lead eagerly. Eager means with enthusiasm, with energy, and excitement. Elders need to exude these attributes as examples for the members of their congregation. Elderly can be a time-consuming, but it's also worth the time and effort required. Elders need to be steadfast when the going gets tough. They cannot shy away from the battle when the evil one attacks the flock. You know, it's, it's, frankly, it's not pleasant or easy to take God's side against the culture. But we have a powerful model in Jesus, the good shepherd, laying down his life for the sheep. All elders must have a rock-solid belief and trust in God's word, in order to stand for God in a world that seems to be turning its back on biblical truth. Elders need to remember what Jesus told Peter that morning by the Sea of Galilee, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. And if we follow, all of us follow, the example of the Good Shepherd, we will be able to do that in a manner that is for our good, the good of our church body, the good of our world, and for God's glory. And let me tell you that it does not get much better than that this side of heaven. Now Jay's going to come up and take us through verse 3. Good morning, or good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Knobloch, and I have the honor and privilege of being one of your campus elders here at Near North. Um, I had a little bit of background about myself. Uh, my wife, Bonnie, and I have been coming to Park for uh, a little over 10 years. Um, I've been an elder for a little over three um, I have a three-and-a-half-old daughter, Lucy, who's back there, and she would love to tell you that she's almost four. I also have another uh, daughter, Vivian, who's uh, one years old. 
Um, so I call them my gang of girls between Bonnie, Lucy, and Vivian. Um, before I get started, I just want to give you guys an encouragement that maybe you can take away and apply to your own life uh, before I dive into verse 3 here. Um, you may or may not know this, but we have a great team of staff and volunteers here at Near North. And um, Jason and Trevor and Steve and Camille, and I could go on and on. They are a fantastic team, but there is a lot of hard work and um, effort put into putting on each uh, ser service, um, whether it's starting Saturday night through Sunday night. There is a lot of effort um, an emotional effort to put into that on a weekly basis. I'm normally sitting down there with each of you, listening to the message, uh, worshiping with, the, with you with the songs. Um, and this week I have the honor of putting together a very short message, and so I got a very small glimpse but it, it, of the effort and work that they put in on a weekly basis. And so I want to encourage you with this. If you see them doing well, if you see them going the extra mile, or they, there's something that stuck out to you that they really um, just crushed it and did well, reach out to them and tell them a job well done um, and encourage them with that. Um, I think that a lot of times we think these things in our head and, and we just assume that other people are telling them and encouraging them along the way. Um, but let's go that extra step and, and encourage them with that. Let's be a, a campus that's known for being um, encouraging and thankful. So Jackson came up and um, unpacked what an elder is. And then Emil came up and unpacked... Um, uh, what an elder does and feeding and protecting the flock. And I'm going to build on what they did and I'm going to explain how an elder should do this tonight. And I'm going to be uh, um, explaining out of verse 3, which says, Not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. Uh, Peter provides this compare and contrast of not domineering, but being an example. Um, and I think that Peter chose the term domineering uh, for a couple reasons. But the first reason is that the readers at that point would have known exactly what he was talking about. At that point, at the time that this letter was written, the Romans were in a position of superiority and exercised control over the others under their superiority um, by domineering over them. There was this hierarchy at the time that allowed the Romans to rule in unpleasant and unloving ways merely because of their rank and title. Jesus and even others throughout the New Testament mention this um, domineering approach. And in fact, it's the reason that the disciples were actually hopeful that Jesus had come back to set up an earthly kingdom to overthrow the Roman government and stop, put an end to this uh, domineering um, approach. Uh, domineering is when someone asserts their will over another in an arrogant way. This generally occurs when there is a person, um, there is a person or a group of people that believe or they actually do have um, this rank or title over other people. Um, they believe that this rank or title allows them to tell the other person what to do and expect that person to follow their commands merely because of their position. Other translations use the term lording over, which provides the illustration of a king ruling over his kingdom and being able to tell his people exactly what to do merely because he is the king. The bottom line is that a person that is domineering is doing this because they are in a position of superiority or power over someone else. So when Peter tells his fellow elders not to domineer over those in their care, the readers know exactly what Peter is talking about, which is that elders should not say, think, or even act as if I have this title of elder, so you should follow or listen to me merely because of that. Instead, Peter rejects that and instead instructs the elders to be examples to the flock, leading by modeling rather than commanding. Peter is telling the elders to live it out in their own lives before they instruct others and let others see this example in their own life and to be able to model it. So what then are elders supposed to live out in their own life? Paul answers this question in a letter to Timothy. 
who was someone that had followed Paul and learned from his example, Paul instructs Timothy in the context of becoming an elder. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I love this list. It covers everything. But as I started examining my own life, as I was preparing this message, I started asking myself, do I really want people to fo- always follow my example of speech? How I talk to people, how I talk to my wife, how I talk to the people that I work with, how I talk to people here at church, even my emails or how, my text messages, are they uh, an example worthy of being followed? How about my conduct? How I am acting at, at home or at work or here at church again? How about my love? for others, or my faith, my purity? I think the honest answer to all of these questions is that I don't really want people to always follow my example. But I think here's the beautiful thing about the gospel, is that we can be an example by showing others how to respond when we mess up, or in failure, or in the face of sin. Sometimes this is just as impactful as actually setting a positive example. Let me give you an example. So my three-year-old daughter, um, I can tell her until I'm blue in the face to ask for forgiveness when she's unkind or unloving to someone, perhaps at the playground, perhaps down in the loop, or somewhere else. Um, And I'm not sure that it always sets in. But here's the thing, and it's humbling is that when I model this to her and she sees me asking for forgiveness from her, when I go up to her and I ask for forgiveness, Lucy, I am sorry for losing my temper or losing my patience, or I ask for forgiveness from my wife in front of my daughter, I think that it starts to set in and she really starts to grasp grasp this concept of forgiveness. So sometimes how we respond when we mess up is a, a way of Um, being an example to others. As I um, went through this, there's there's a lot of lessons and takeaways that can be taken from verse 3, and a lot of good encouragement to me. But there's two that stuck out to me this week um, as I prepared for this message. And the first takeaway is this. Elders set an example by being present and available. Think back to the illustration that Jackson Uh, gave at the beginning about Rafe and the bicycle team. If the leader of the pack, if the captain, the upperclassman, the person that had been through this before, wasn't watching behind him as Rafe started uh, falling farther and farther behind, he would have never known like what was happening, and he wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to Rafe and tell him to keep his elbows in and to get on his wheel. So the fact that his, um, his captain was present and available and aware of what was going on is one of the things that I think elders need to be doing. They need to be uh, with the people of the church and understanding what's going on. But here's the thing. I think that the greatest example of this actually comes from Jesus. In Matthew 4, one of Jesus' first recorded statements is, Follow me and I will make you fisher of men. I think this phrase, follow me, is one of the best illustrations of being an example. Jesus is saying to his disciples, come, watch me, walk with me, be around me, model your life after me. I'm going to make my life available to you so that your life begins to look like mine. This language of being an example is modeled perfectly by Christ. I also think that, as Emil uh, explained earlier, that the sheep and shepherd analogy is very instrumental in understanding this concept um, of being uh, an example. Imagine a shepherd walking and his, uh, his flock coming behind him and him calling them by name to follow him. I think that is a great example of being, or that is a great illustration of being an example. So elders need to be present and available. They need to be spending time with the people of this church. This may mean serving alongside them. It may mean breaking bread with them and eating meals with them. It may mean worshiping with them. 
If they're not present and available, it's impossible to be an example. The second takeaway is that elders set an example by being transparent and honest. Being present and available isn't always necessarily enough. Elders need to be transparent and honest about their own spiritual journey and how the gospel is being applied to their life. It's important for them to be transparent with others about what God's teaching them. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to follow the example of someone who is fake or is holding back from you or not being transparent with you. Um, This is one of the reasons that I personally and the elders want to be involved in small groups so that they have the opportunity on a weekly basis to share from their own life, to share struggles, to share how the gospel is being applied to those struggles, and to be able to encourage other people, to be able to hear what's going on in the lives of people at this church. Um, So I think for uh, elders, the second big takeaway is to be transparent and honest. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with two uh, short encouragements. The first is to hold your elders to a higher standard, to make sure that they are being present and available, that they're being transparent and honest. This may mean reaching out to them and grabbing a cup of coffee with them or maybe stopping them in the hallway and introducing yourself and getting to know them. And as elders, and for myself, I I know this is true, and I know for the other elders as well, but we love it when you stop us and introduce yourself and tell us what's going on in your life. The second encouragement that I want to leave you with is this. We talked a lot today about uh, elders being examples, or I talked a lot about that. But let me ask you, who are you being an example to? More specifically, who is watching your conduct? Who is watching your love? your faith, your purity. I think that we as a church, as a, as a campus, as the Near North Campus, we can, we can help each other by being an um, example to each other and encouraging each other along the way. So now Jackson's going to come up and uh, finish us out in verses uh, 4 and 5. Thanks, Jay. Let's look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Chief shepherd. It's the only time this title is used in all the Bible. The idea that you have one shepherd who is over all these other shepherds. So it's to remind us that elders have a boss. Elders have a boss. We are not franchise owners and operators. We're managers. Someone else's business. This is someone else's church. And I got to tell you, there's times when I'm grateful for that because I can feel the weight of this place. And it's important for me to remind myself, this isn't my church. I don't own this church. Jesus is the one who died for this church. Jesus is the one that has secured the, the life for those of us that are in this church. It's his church, and we submit to him. We're merely under shepherds with delegated authority. There is no replacement for Jesus. The elders don't step into the role of Jesus. We elevate Jesus. We make much of Jesus. We hold Jesus as the one in which we worship. And then we are obedient to him, to his words, to teach all of his words, whether they're popular or not, whether we want to all hear them or not. We live with a delegated authority from Jesus. Now, look down with me again. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive It's a reminder to those elders they will be held accountable. We will be held accountable. When we stand before Jesus in his return or in our death, we will be evaluated based on how we eldered while we were here. You think your yearly review at work is going to be tough? You imagine standing before Christ as an elder and he walks through how we led and shepherded and how we cared or how we didn't? There is accountability before the Lord for what we do. But yet, as difficult as eldering can be, and yet there is great joy in eldering, there will be a reward. Look down again. We'll receive, and that's language around wages, of receiving wages. Elders will receive a reward. On the day that we stand before Christ and we go through our evaluation, those elders that elder well will receive a reward. Let me show you a picture. 
what he's referring to here, what Peter's referring to, is that when a general came back from fighting and was victorious, like you hear you see with Augustus, he would receive a wreath. Or in the Olympics, in the early Olympics, in athletic events, if someone won an event, they would receive a wreath. But the problem with that wreath, it would eventually die, it would shrivel up. So Peter reminds them that there is a reward for elders, and it is an eternal wreath. It's an unfading, look at that word, an unfading crown of glory that is given to us that will last throughout our eternity. It's a wreath that has been secured for us in the victory of Jesus. It is important for elders and for you to remind ourselves that what we gain from Jesus is because he has won it. You too, every follower of Christ gets a crown of glory as well. We are told several times throughout the New Testament. Our reward is won for us through the life and the death of the chief shepherd. Jesus, our chief shepherd, has come and has protected us from our greatest enemies, the enemy of rebellion against God and the consequences of that, and spiritual death. That in Jesus' victory as chief shepherd and in his protection of us as his sheep, He wins for us, he gains for us victory over sin and over death. And Jesus did this not by wearing an unfading crown of glory, but from wearing a crown of thorns upon his head. Jesus bore the crown of humiliation so that you and I might wear the crown of glory. Jesus' victory stand was a cross and a grave so that you and I might be able to be identified with him at the right hand of the Father where Jesus sits. Jesus, who was scorned by others, became our victor, and he became our victor through his death and resurrection, and he shares that victory with us, with us as elders, but with all followers of Christ by giving us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an indication of his victory that all of us have the presence of Jesus' power reside in us as followers of Christ. And what we do as elders and what we all do as followers of Christ, we get this crown, but Revelation tells us that the day will come, we will take the crown off our head, and we will go before the throne of Jesus, who will sit in that throne, and we will place our crown at his feet as a sign of worship, because we recognize Whatever we have and whatever we've been able to do, it is because Jesus has empowered us to be able to do it through his spirit. And so our act of worship is to say to him, thank you for what you've done. Whatever we have gained, it's because you have given it to us and you have won it. Now let's finish up by looking at verse 5. What's our responsibility? Maybe you're sitting there going, okay, Jackson, I get it, man. we got elders who lead the church, and it's a very high call, and they are held accountable by Jesus. Okay, big deal. How does that affect me? Verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, elder, not elder, old, young, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. This ties back to 1 Peter 2, and we talked about this for several weeks, that we all subject ourselves for the Lord's sake. We all submit. We, as followers of Christ, submit to the elders that God has placed over us. But, but, Houston, we have a problem. Because we don't like being told what to do. We don't want anybody to be the boss of me. Several weeks ago when Don and I were here sharing out of 1 Peter 3 about marriage, remember we talked about what that, that uh, we want to have our own way, and Donna had an illustration from YouTube about uh, two sisters arguing about, I'm the boss of you, you're not the boss of me, I'm the boss of you. You're not the boss of me. And that's kind of our motto. You are not the boss of me. And it falls into the church as well. No one's going to tell me what to do. An author that I've been reading, a guy named Brad Thor, who is a winning PBS producer and a New York Times bestseller and, and come to find out graduated from Francis Parker, where our Lincoln Park campus meets, wrote in a book that I was reading recently. He said, individualism is hardwired into our DNA. We want to make our own decisions, even if it means making mistakes. We don't want other people telling us what to do. And in the church, God raises up elders to guide us, to lead us, to protect us. 
and at times even to tell us this is how we are to live in a way that honors God. And there's a piece of us that resists this. My wife told me for years, she said, you know, I'm going to put on your tombstone when you die on your gravestone. You would rather seek forgiveness than permission. Because that was always my motto for years. I'll just seek forgiveness than permission. It's too hard working through all the red tape and all the different levels. Man, I'll just go get this done. And if I get in trouble for it, I'll just ask for forgiveness. And then I became an elder. And I realized it's people just like me who are a pain in the butt for the elders. Because I didn't want to listen, man. I didn't want to figure out and find out from them what we needed to do. I'm just going to go get my job done. But then the elders, when I became an elder, realized how important it is to understand the whole church and all the things that are taking place in the church. And there are times when the elders might need to say, not yet, not yet. We submit ourselves to elders as an act of worship. When we submit ourselves to the elders that God has placed over us, it is an act of worship. Now let me remind you, before I'm an elder, I am first a sheep. And so I submit myself to the elders as well. Even though I sit as an elder, I submit myself to the elders because before I'm an elder, I'm a sheep. And it's my act of worship when I submit myself to the elders that God has placed over our life. And haven't we seen this already done in the life of Jesus who submitted himself to his Father? In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Again, that accountability. We are responsible, and God will call us into account, but it's the job of all of us then to submit and make the job of the elders easier by our willingness to submit. But let me remind you, as Trevor reminded me last night, we don't submit blindly. The church never asked you to submit blindly. You should ask questions. You should be able to challenge. You should be able to poke around. You do it respectively. We do it graciously. We do it with love. But you don't submit blindly. You know your elders or you know people who know your elders and you learn about them and then you trust them. But you ask those questions. If we're making a decision here and you wonder about, you should reach out. That's why you'll find all our staff. We answer our own phone. We answer our own email. You should be able to approach any elder here and ask a question. It's that important to us. We don't submit blindly.